Doable Discipleship is the name of the show. My name is Doug Jones. I'm Jason Wheeland. <laughs> and this is a quirky intro for the week. Uh, this is a Saddleback Church podcast designed to help you deepen your friendship with God, but we like to call it the show that helps you grow and points you to cool things like Advent Retreat we got coming up. Guys, um, if you're ready to get into just, you know, the Christmas spirit, if you want to uh, to take a uh, take a morning and just refocus. Focus your mind on on the truths of Christmas, why we celebrate Christmas. Then I'd encourage you to check out the Advent Retreat that we have at the Saddleback Rancho Capistrano Retreat Center. You can find all the information. Oh, I should say it's on Saturday, December first, um, from I think nine to noon. You can find all the information at saddleback.com/retreats. And if you can't make it down there, we now for the first time have a um a downloadable advent retreat guide that you can do on your own you can have your own advent retreat friends so you can also find that saddleback.com slash retreats and just download that it's interactive so you can click and type in notes into the guide you can listen to the songs that uh that we do at the retreat right there in the guide guys no reason not to so good there are so many perks to being at saddleback look at that uh today do we have anything else to promote before I jump in? That was it. Well, that's certainly more than enough. Advert retreat, great thing. Well, let's continue with this two-parter on conflict resolution, uh, this reconciliation uh, special that we're doing in advance of Thanksgiving and Christmas. You know you need it. We kicked it off last week. We talked about many things. We talked about uh, what the sources of conflict can often be. And we started talking about how to resolve it, specifically thinking about um, how do we overlook minor offenses and things like that, show grace, love with the love of Jesus. Today we're continuing and we're going to start getting practical about how do you how do you deal with more serious conflict. And we're going to start by talking about the topic of confession. So stick around. So let's talk about confessing my part of the conflict. Uh, there's a verse here. <laughs> there's no reference Great on this Great way to verse. laugh at the verse. <laughs> there's no reference there. Uh, there's a verse. We're going to look it up. <laughs> we'll put the link in the... Sh- I don't know, I, I'll have it how for does you it just momentarily. Not, Jason's going to look it up. The verse goes like this. If you hide your sins, you will not succeed. If you confess and reject them, you'll receive mercy. What do you got? And I got Proverbs twenty eight thirteen. There you go. Look at us. Teamwork, making the dream work. <laughs> Next time, let's get that reference on the sheet. Uh, so confession includes repentance. And if you're not super familiar with the term repentance, which many of you are if you've been in church for a while, but repentance deals with a turning. So we'll, we'll talk about that a little more specifically here. First, repentance can be defined as changing the way we think or behave. So there's a turning involved, a turning and going in another direction. It's waking up to the fact that we've been deceiving ourselves and that our attitudes and ideas and our goals have been wrong. So with repentance comes an awareness or repentance follows awareness. We become aware of something we've been doing wrong and then we react to it by turning the other way. So it's a turning from sin and a turning back to God. Acts chapter 3 verse 19 says, So you must change you must change your hearts and lives. Come back to God and he will forgive your sins. Then the Lord will send uh, the time of rest. So repentance is a step toward increased peace in our lives. And it's an uh, integral part of conflict resolution as well. Yeah, so um, in this talk on confession, what we're going to give you is, is is something that we like to call the seven A's of true confession. So we got uh, seven points here, and they all start with A. So maybe it'll be easy to remember. Or as we like to say, <laughs> for all the sheep in the <laughs> audience, you got that one. That's good. <laughs> That'll be the dumbest thing I do all week. <laughs> Let's see if I can't get top to be it. Seen. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Um, the first A ah, is... Um, Address everyone involved, okay? That's God, self, and others. That's all who were offended, okay? And, and an important verse here that, that, go, that goes along with this point is Psalm 32, 5, which says, Then I acknowledged my sin to you, and it did not cover up my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the guilt of my sin. Hmm, that's good. 
All right, so address everybody involved. Make sure you cover all the bases there. Remember, we said that there is there are three levels of reconciliation. We talked about that last week, mm-hmm. so make sure you listen to last week's episode before you do this one. Uh, number two, second A is avoid if, but, and maybe words or anything like it. Don't lessen your responsibility or shift the blame. So don't say things like, I'm sorry that I did this, but if you had not done that, then this wouldn't be a problem. Or, you know, uh, I'm sorry that I, you know, wronged you, but I really did it because of this or or that sort of thing. So it's a way of lessening your responsibility for the thing that was done uh, to the other. It's really casting blame elsewhere. It's casting blame elsewhere, and it takes the, it really takes all the momentum out of your confession, and it makes it feel like it is not, like it's not sincere. Like what you're really doing is trying to point out something wrong in the other person rather than own up to something that you've done wrong personally. So um, if, if, you, if you use words like that, you are taking the thrust out of your confession, and it won't be received as sincere. That's good. And then the third A is admit specifically. Um, be detailed, deal with your attitudes as well as actions, and identify biblical principles you violated. This is really important, and it's something that we— talk about when we talk about a prayer in quiet time is is be specific, be detailed when uh, confessing sins or wrongdoings. And, and the truth of the, of the matter that we're getting at here is God knows every single detail. God knows every single little bit. So be specific in it, because if there's stuff that you're trying to hide to say, I know I did this, but in the back of my mind say, I also did this, but I'm not going about it. <laughs> it's God knows, <laughs> you know, so you can't hide anything. So be specific, be detailed, deal with your attitudes as well as actions and identify biblical principles that you violated. Yeah, that's good. What, what that does is helps the other person feel like they're being seen. People want to know that you're really understanding mm-hmm. the harm that you've caused them. They want to know that, that, that you're comprehending that, that you're not just giving them a token confession. Uh, all right. The, so the fourth one is acknowledge the hurt express sorrow for the hurt you've caused. Uh, and, and this is a big one because there's not just sort of the um, like the objective wrongdoing that was done, like the breaking of God's command or, or that kind of thing, but you may have also caused pain for the other person. And there's a need to acknowledge that. Um, pain, <laughs> if you don't know, is really unpleasant. And if you've caused... Pain hurts. <laughs> yeah, pain hurts. And if you've caused pain for somebody else, part of what, part of what they... Uh, are going to need to hear from you as a sense of remorse for the pain that you caused. Again, it says, I see you, I understand you, and I recognize that what I have done has caused sorrow and pain for you, and that bothers me. I'm not okay that I that I hurt you in this way. That's good. And sometimes it may be hard for us to recognize hurt that you may have caused or that another person was hurt. So, uh, sometimes you may not understand why the person feels hurt, mm-hmm. um, but that doesn't free you from the hurt just because you don't understand why or maybe it wouldn't have hurt you you would think it doesn't mean that it didn't happen it doesn't mean that the other person doesn't feel differently yeah and so it's important to acknowledge that to acknowledge that people react handle things and and feel things differently than you do yeah come to terms with that Mm-hmm. And then it'll make this whole process a little bit easier. Yeah, it, it it makes no difference whether you meant to hurt that person or not. So the whole I didn't mean it, you know, defense falls down. It doesn't yeah. matter. You caused pain. You got to make it right. Exactly. Um, the fifth A is accept the consequences. Work hard to make restitution and repair damages. Don't think that you can just, you know... Uh, you know, admit that something was done wrong, you know, is wrong, and just expect, great, we're all good, easy peasy, yeah. that was, that was great. It's, a lot of times there are consequences. It could be, it could be um, that you have to rebuild trust in a relationship. That's a consequence. Um, it, it could, you know, it could be a variety of different things. A, as we just talked about hurt, you know, that you may have caused the other person, there's consequences that come with that. Mm-hmm. And so um, just accept the consequences. Understand that, okay, I'm going to have to own up to this. I'm going to have to face the the consequences of whatever um, happened. And But but approach it from, from a place of wanting to make restitution, of wanting to repair what may have been broken, of mm-hmm. wanting to make things better. Yeah. 
making restitution dis- displays the sincerity and honesty behind your confession. It yeah. says, I recognize that I've done something wrong and I want to do my best to reverse the effects of what I did, it's even though that may not be possible. It's the humility piece that we've been talking about yeah. all through this. For yeah. sure. Uh, next one, number six is alter your behavior. So have a plan about how you're going to react differently in the future. So the, so the thing about conflict often, especially when it's with someone that you're close to, is you may deal with the same conflict again and again and again. Um, and very often... If you don't make serious behavioral changes, you will end up falling into the same conflict at a later date. And then you find yourself having the same conversation. Uh, anyone who's been friends with someone for a long time, or you may have had conversations like this with your parents or with a spouse, and you find yourself having the same conversations about the same uh, hurts again and again and again. And it's because somewhere along the line, someone didn't alter their behavior. So have a plan how you can act differently in the future so that you can prevent this hurt from happening all over again. And this may be a process, it may take time. Um, you know, very often we don't we don't get it right off the bat. One conversation fixes it. Sometimes when we have a pattern of behavior, it can take a process to sort of steer the ship in a healthier direction, but but engage in that process. Great. And then the seventh, the final in the, in the list of as we got is... Um, <laughs> I didn't do it justice. Ah, yes. Um, not the only is goofball. Ask for forgiveness and allow time, okay? Mm-hmm. Uh, sometimes you can just, uh, what's the term? Hug it out and say, <laughs> yeah. hey, bro, we good? And they can <laughs> say, yeah, we good. Uh, sometimes that works. Yeah, not, sometimes. Not every time. With minor issues, yes. With minor issues, yes. So just, you know, ask for forgiveness allow time. Asking for forgiveness is is important because it's it's acknowledgement. It's it, it's seeking to bring the conflict full circle almost, right? Yeah. And say, so, you know, and then just allowing time for that relationship to heal. Um all wounds take time to heal. That's right. Um uh, and in and, and this and that's what this is 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 a wound. Um and an important note in this whole process is do not use this process for your benefit, but to truly glorify God and serve others. You are there to serve the other person, not to gain comfort for yourself. Mm-hmm. That last piece deserves repeating, yeah. not to gain comfort for yourself. Your primary motive should not be, I want to feel better Right. So I'm going to do it's it's it should be to bring God glory in seeking reconciliation like we talked about all in the last episode and it's to help the other person too. Okay? Mm-hmm. And the truth is is that you may not feel better immediately afterwards. Yeah. You may still feel kind of lousy. You know, but over time, but it, it, and if you just think of it in the short term, it may not sound that great. But in the long term, you are going to feel better for doing this. You are going to be happy that you did. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it, even even if in the short term, you, you may not feel as you know all that all that great. Yeah, think about it in terms of what we talked about. God commands us to make reconciliation. Yeah. It's about. A relationship. It's in the Great Commandment. Everything we talked about in last in last week's episode, and so and it's about giving God glory. Yeah, that's great. Uh, so having these kind of confession conversations takes tact, and that means we got to speak carefully. We got, we have to be very thoughtful about how we approach these conversations. James chapter one verses nineteen through twenty says, "My dear brothers, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry." For a man's anger does not bring about the righteous life that God desires. So how do we how do we speak carefully? One great way is by waiting. That just means taking your time. Uh, we actually talked about this. Uh, we talked about, uh, I think it was in our Silence and Solitude episode a while back, we talked about how adopting the habit of silence and solitude, you can even bring a little bit mm-hmm. of silence into relationships and into conversations where you take the time to stop and pause. So you've got time to respond thoughtfully to what other people are saying to you. Uh, the second way is to pay attention to what they're saying. Don't think ahead. Um, a lot of times in conversations, this is what I do. I always think like three steps ahead in the conversation. Like if they say this, this is where I'm going to go. Like you're, So you're like plotting your moves. And that is actually a really manipulative way <laughs> to live your life. Playing chess while you're having conversation. Well, and, and I think, I think 
I think we do that to certain to, to different degrees. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think I tend to do that maybe more than the average person. So what I have to do is just chill out a little bit and just try to make sure I'm giving my genuine and full attention to the person that I'm speaking with rather than trying to kind of plot, you know, plot my response and, and that sort of thing. Um, also by reflecting. So summarize their main points. It shows that what they said is important to you. And by reflect, I don't mean sit there for a long period of silence while you think about what they said, although that may be a part of it. Reflecting in the sense of you bounce back to them what they've said. And that conveys that you have heard what they said, you understand it, and you're able to say it back to them. Um, you don't have to be a parrot, but it is great to to sort of um, to give them some feedback that shows them that you're actually picking up what they're laying down. And then by agreeing, that means that you accept the truth rather than being defensive or, or blaming others. Um, so if someone else is, is you know, bringing an offense to you, you have to have the humility to receive what they're saying. Even if you don't agree with them 100%, you can at the very least agree that what you did caused them pain. You can at least own that much, if not genuine wrongdoing, at least causing uh, hurt for them. Uh, so yeah, those are some good guidelines on how to speak gently. That's good. And then, uh, on top of that is to speak the truth in love. Okay. Ephesians 4 15 says, speaking the truth in love, we will in all things grow up into him who is the head. That is Christ. That shows just the importance of speaking the truth in love right there. Um, don't go to them with the law. (laughs) Don't start just, you know, railing down on the law. Instead, bring the gospel of hope. It's fo- it's preaching on the positives is something that we talk about here. It's, it's, it's focusing on the hope that is found in the gospel and the hope that is found in the principles of Jesus. Don't focus on what they have done or perhaps failed to do, but what God has done and will do for them through Christ. I'm going to say that one more time because I know there's a lot of, of um, has and throughs and stuff like that. Don't focus on what they have done or failed to do, but what God has done and will do for them through Christ. Um, a great example of this is, uh, is what did Jesus say to the Samaritan woman? You may remember. Did he, did he just rain down talking about her sinful life, just going off and on and on and on about it? No. He engaged her about truth about eternal life, and about true worship. He was focusing on the positives. He was focusing on change. He was focusing on the hope that we have in relationship with God. He was not focusing on on all the things that you did wrong, ba 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 just wrong, 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 and just making her feel worse and worse and worse. Instead, he was focusing on, on truth. He was mm-hmm. focusing on the hope of eternal life, and he was focusing on how to have true worship. Yeah, good. All right, let's talk about the steps of biblical reconciliation. And this, of course, is going to come from the classic uh, passage from the New Testament, Matthew 18, verses 15 through 17, where Jesus taught how we ought to resolve conflict within the family of God. And he says this, If your brother sins against you, go and show him his fault, just between the two of you. If he listens to you, you have won your brother over. But if he will not listen, take one or two others along so that every matter may be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. If he refuses to listen then, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, treat him as you would a pagan or a tax collector. So what we, ha- what we have here is a, 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 an ascending process, a process that, that increases in um, strength and even to a certain degree, severity with each stage in an effort to draw people back into um, godly Christian relationship with one another and resolve the conflict. So as we see here, step one is that a conversation just happens between the two of you. And, and all that means is that whenever it's possible, a conflict that exists between two people should be resolved between just those two people. The verse also tells us to restore the relationship um, and not just to confront the sin. So the idea here is that you're not just going to that person in order to, um, like Jason said, rail against them and to, to, you know, knock them around and um, beat them over the head with the truth and that kind of thing. The idea here is that you're, you're approaching them in a loving way in order to restore the relationship. So you're not just about like, this is what's right. You're also about, you know, what's right is for us to be, you know, united once again in healthy relationship. Uh, Something to look out for is gossip. 
or veiled prayer requests. And the, the point here is that if a conflict exists between the two of you, and you still have yet to have a healing one-on-one -on -one conversation, then that means you deliberately keep that information to yourself, and you don't start spreading things about that other person. Uh, it's easy when you're in, um, in the midst of conflict with someone to start getting really you know, just start doing ugly things, and sometimes the, the anger that you're feeling can start seeping out in ugly ways, and it's it's a stereotype now, but it's true. You see this stuff coming out in prayer requests and small groups and with other people, and, oh, really pray for so-and-so. They're really, oh, you'll never believe what they did to me, and I'm just really concerned about what they're going through, and yada, yada. And sometimes we look for ways to sort of diminish the way others view that person because we're angry at them. And so look out for gossip. The New Testament has a zero-tolerance policy on gossip. Galatians chapter 6, verse 1 says, Brothers, if someone is caught in a sin, you who are spiritual should restore him gently. But watch yourself, and you may all, uh, excuse me, but watch yourself, or you also may be tempted. So we got to look out for that. You don't want to, you know, in a response to someone else wronging you, retaliate by wronging them by spreading rumors about them and that kind of ugly stuff. So God tells us to be gentle in what we say, uh, and God wants us to adjust the intensity of our communication depending on the person's position and the urgency of the situation. So we got to be careful not to fall into sin by using abusive, rough language with them. So it begins in a one-on-one -on -one conversation. What's step two, Jason? Uh, step two, so if 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 you've tried step one and, and, and you've talked with the person and it still seems to be this conflict, it hasn't been resolved, then step two says to take someone with you. And this also might be something that you might... And you even have to do as step one, and we'll, and we'll talk a little bit about that. But the Bible recommends face-to-face -face meetings as the desired first step towards reconciliation, but it does not teach this as the only way, okay? Because the Bible gives many examples of reconciliation through other people, and this might be necessary. When, here, here's just some examples of when this <clears throat> might be important or might be required. Uh, one, if you are dealing with a person from another culture or tradition where this is customary, that may happen. It might be it might be good to always have another person with you, especially if the culture or customs, if that's more common in that. Uh, second, if there's a big difference in power, this could be an important one too. If you're dealing with somebody that that has a lot of power or or that is a superior or that kind of thing, it might be good to bring someone with you as well. Um, third, if one party might intimidate the other. That's important too. Have a friend with you as back or, or, or as support in that if you're feeling intimidated. And fourth, uh, one person was abused by the other or there is concern for manipulation or abuse. It's always good to have another person there, an, a, another set of eyes, a, another person who can say what happened and mm -hmm. to be a presence in the room. Um, and some good advice here, don't try to reconcile over the phone or by email. Now, over the phone, it may be necessary if it's a long distance thing, but mm. that should never be like your straight go-to. And one of the primary reasons, I think, is because you lose a lot of nuance um, by email or over the phone that you don't, you know, instead of being with the other person or face-to-face, -face, mm -hmm. um, it's, it's so much easier to just stay mad it's it's so much easier to stick to your guns if you will if you're you know if you don't see the other person or if it's just a voice or a text thread that you're reading or, or you know but when you're with the person if you're face to face if you're looking them in the eye it's a lot harder to just stay angry all the time it's it's a, it's it, because you can see the other person is you can see you know oftentimes you can see the emotion, you mm -hmm. can see what they're feeling, and you can get a better sense of what the other person is feeling and for what is going on. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of that gets lost over the phone or by email or text or whatever. Yeah. Um, and we see in Colossians 3.12 says, therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience, and all those things um, are much easier to clothe yourselves with when talking face-to-face. -face. Mm -hmm. I'll add one, one more thought to the, to the taking another person, too. Uh, I think one, one more caution is uh, you, you need to make sure you bring someone who uh, will be a, a helpful restorative party. Yes. 
Uh, the goal here is not, okay, let me find my best ally on my side so that I can tip the, so I can tip the scales of this conflict in my favor, mm -hmm. or we can gang up on this person and, and, you know, make them come around. That That's not the point, And that's not the spirit of what Jesus is saying here. Let's gang up on yeah. and bully and, and, and force this person to, to make things right. The point is to bring along somebody who is godly and wise, who cares about both of you, and preferably who knows both of you well, and who can kind of stand in the gap and help be a bit of an arbitrator through this through this process. Somebody of high integrity. Yeah, yeah, totally. So think somebody who loves both of you, who wants the best for both of you, and wants to see the the best possible outcome that gives the most glory to God come out of it. Uh, not just somebody who you know is going to get on your side no matter what. Yeah. All right, and then there's step three, which is the... It's the highest level. We, we can't solve this any other way. Step three is you take it to the church. Uh, and that's what Jesus taught us to do. And there's a, you know, there's a few ways you can do that. What it doesn't necessarily need to be is that a newsletter goes out to the entire church, <laughs> you know, asking everyone to weigh in on this issue or <laughs> that sort of thing. I think some people get a picture of, what, what, well, bringing it to the church, does that mean that anyone who's in an unresolved conflict needs to get up on the stage on the weekend and we need only need to weigh in on it to decide what's going to happen on each of these issues? No, that's not the case. Uh, it doesn't necessarily mean bring them before the whole church. What it means is that you bring the body of Christ to bear on the situation. And there are a few different ways that you can do that if you're a, a member of Saddle if you're not a member of Saddleback Church, um, you need to look to your local church, wherever, whatever church you're connected with, and look to them for help. Uh, maybe talk to your pastor or talk to somebody on staff and ask them, you know, what's the best way for me to move forward with this conflict that I'm, that I'm working through? I've already gone through the first two steps. I've talked to them individually. I've taken somebody to, to try to help, you know, work through the situation with us. Both have been unsuccessful. You know, what do you recommend now and how can our church help us do that? Uh, I'll give you a few, a few recommendations for here at Saddleback Church. If you come to this stage and you're like, I really need my church's help in resolving this in resolving this conflict that I've been unsuccessful with otherwise, uh, if it's a small group conflict, something that's going on within your Saddleback small group, uh, speak with your community leader. You should know who that is. If not, then um, you know you can call our church office here. We'll we'll put the number in the show notes, and you can speak with them. Ask them to connect you with the small groups team, and ask for your community leader. And that person is specifically there to help shepherd you and guide you as you lead your group, and you can be the one to, to help bring in that help. Uh, you may, if you have conflict with a, a spouse that you haven't been able to work through, uh, check out our church counseling ministry, which we linked in our last episode. We'll link in this one as well. Um, so church counseling can be helpful. Uh, you might want to get into a support group as well. Support groups can be a great way to work through um, some of their internal issues. Uh, and then there's Celebrate Recovery. Celebrate Recovery is a great way for you personally to work on whatever's going on in you that may be causing conflict as well. Uh, and if you guys attend Celebrate Recovery together, then you may be able to speak with leadership there for help on that as well. Uh, another way you can do it here at Saddleback, if you have just a general conflict that you need you need some advice on and need to work through, is calling our minister of the day, which is a pastor who's always on call and ready to take, uh, take your phone calls and, and talk with you about whatever you may be going through. And so... Um, you may need help in that regard as well. So we'll give um, you know links and and phone numbers to help you uh, get whatever help you need through that. All right, <clears throat> let's talk about uh, reconciliation and uh, specifically we'll talk about how reconciliation includes forgiveness. That true reconciliation must include biblical forgiveness, and that means we have to forgive the same way that God forgave us. And forgiveness, we know, is extremely important to God. It is kind of the crux of reconciliation. There really can be no reconciliation in almost anything without forgiveness coming alongside it. Um, and it's God's greatest gift to us, and it's what He expects us to do to others. Colossians 3.13 says, Bear with each other and forgive whatever grievances you may have against one another. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. So when Jesus told us how to pray— uh, he also told us to forgive others just the same way that God had forgiven us. This is one of the key ways that we're meant to emulate him, that we forgive others because God has forgiven us for so much. Matthew 6, 12 says, And forgive us our sins just as we have forgiven those who have sinned against us. And a big, a big question to reflect on here is just what would happen if each of us chose to forgive others and um, treat them the same way that God treats us? If we gave the kind of forgiveness to others that God has given to us, how would the family of God, how would all your relationships be transformed? Hint, for the better. 
once again, Doug, you did a perfect segue because the next point is that forgiveness is a choice. Forgiveness is a, a decision, okay? Mm-hmm. Forgiveness is not a feeling. It's not just forgetting or it's not excusing, right? It is a choice. It is I am making the choice to forgive um, a wrongdoer. It, you know, um, it is... Evildoer. It, it, yes. <laughs> it is releasing the person from the penalty of being s- separated from us. There was a barrier that was created when a sin was made against us or when a wrongdoing was made against us. And forgiveness is releasing the person from that penalty. It's breaking down that barrier. Does that sound familiar to you? It should. Because <laughs> when when someone sins, guys, the greatest offense is against God, not us, okay? And God has unconditionally forgiven the sin through Jesus' death on the cross. We've talked about that. So the question then that you must ask is, do we love God enough to do the same, Mm. right? Doug just read Matthew 6, 12, but it's worth repeating here. Forgive us our sins just as we have forgiven those who have sinned against us. Mm. Do we love God enough to do the same and forgive others? Yeah. Well, I want to cover just some really, really important guidelines for forgiveness. Um, And and this is, uh, the idea here is that biblical forgiveness comes with some promises, four of them specifically. Here are four promises that you are, that are implicit in any um, forgiving conversation. Uh, So what you're saying, though you may not say it out loud, forgiveness entails these four things. First, I will not dwell on this incident. Remember, uh, was it in the last episode or earlier in this episode, we talked about this idea that when God forgave us, he separated our sins from us as far as east is from west. So there's this idea that when we forgive, we are surrendering our right to brood on the issue and to uh, maintain our anger. So I will not dwell on this incident. Second, I will not bring up this incident again and use it against you. So when you forgive, you forfeit the right to bring up that issue to, to your friend or family member or, or whoever you may you know, have this conflict with ever again. Doesn't mean at a later date, it means ever again. You are expunging it from their record. Uh, did I use that right? I don't know. I'm just thinking about, remember that time when I forgave you for this? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Need I remind you? Uh, and third, I will not talk to others about this incident. So this is a, by the way, that's a big New Testament theme, um, the covering of shame, um, that Jesus covered the shame of, of our sin. And um, this is a way that in conversation with, uh, in a restorative conversation with someone as you're forgiving them, you make the same commitment. I will not cause shame for you as a result of this incident. I will, I will uh, protect your reputation. And it will be as though this had never happened. Uh, and then fourth, I will not let this incident stand between us or hinder our personal relationship. Uh, now, what I want to say on that one is um, sometimes the thing that you're forgiving is something that has caused extremely deep and extremely uh, tr- extreme trauma for you. And that may mean that, you know, you might hear that and go, well, I can't just bounce back to the way things were. I, I can't just suddenly trust this person or suddenly feel safe around this person or that sort of thing. Um, this may entail a process of counseling for you um, to, to begin to uh, heal from this, the, the pain that's been caused. Um, but what we're saying here is that at, at, you're making a spiritual decision to, um, you know, as far as, as, far as it is possible, um, to restore the relationship and say, this will no longer be a barrier to our relationship. Yes, and forgiveness does not release an offender from all consequences of sin. And we see this all throughout Scripture. Okay, a couple of examples. God would not allow the Israelites who did not trust him to enter into the promised land. And you can read about that in Numbers 14. God forgave David for adultery and murder, but he still faced consequences. And sometimes the best lessons learned by an offender come from facing the consequences. And we can read about that in Proverbs 19.19. 19. We talked a bit about consequences a little earlier, but it's it's so important to know that, yes, there will be, be consequences because there are consequences for sin. There, it's, it's, it's just a matter of truth. There are consequences for sin. And so mm-hmm. even though there is forgiveness, there are still consequences that have to be faced. And that's, in, in, and that's a part of, of our, 
it's a part of our growth too, yeah. is we learn from consequences. We grow out of consequences. That's great. Let's talk some uh, little doables, shall we? Doable time. Um, okay. Uh, I, we talked about some doables, so let me remember what we talked about. Um, first, <laughs> I <laughs> stalling there for a moment. I was just I was going through it in my brain. Okay, first, um, if there if there is is conflict that you are currently in, if you are if you are are worried or stressed out about the upcoming holidays because of some issues you might have with your family or friends or whatever, go back through these episodes and just go and look through these points and make a plan for yourself. How are you going to approach this season? How are you going to approach any any sort of conflict that is going on in your life? Hmm. I'm telling Chris right now, our producer, uh, let's have, you know, a little outline or a list, you know, in the show notes so that people can go in and just get a summary of what we talked about um, so that you can take some time and think through it and make a plan for yourself. You don't mm. have to go into the season unprepared and just and scared. Is is You can go in and say, I want to make restitution. I want to, I want to bridge any gaps that there are. I want to seek resolution, conflict resolution, That's reconciliation. Uh, yeah. Second is if you know somebody who is, you know, in conflict, who is scared, who, you know, it, it, maybe you have a friend that's like, ah, oh, I hate the holidays because so-and-so comes over and it's just super awkward. And, and I just feel, I get so angry and upset about everything that they say, you know, or whatever. Maybe share these episodes with that friend and talk with them about it and mm-hmm. talk through and help them to make a plan. Um, those are ones off the top of my head. Those are good. I want to remind everybody to check out The Peacemaker by Ken Sandy. Really an excellent book that I've read and thoroughly enjoyed. In fact, I, th- I think I'm due to read it yet again. I think it's it's time to hit. That's one of those ones. You know you have those books. You're like, I need to read that every few years to keep those principles fresh in my mind. So reminding you um, to check that out. Um, and golly, I guess that's it. Yeah, I mean, you can always like or rate and review. Yes, yes. Of course. Those you can do some that. other doables. Well, everybody, that is conflict resolution. I think we covered everything that could possibly be covered. <laughs> I'm sure there's whole <laughs> we didn't miss anything courses taught on such, but hey, we did a fair job. Yeah, there's some tools to help you. All right, everybody, thanks so much for listening. We love you. We'll see you next week. If you enjoyed this episode, consider giving us a rating or a review on iTunes. If you do, you'll help other people find us in the future. You can also listen to these episodes on YouTube. Subscribe to the Saddleback Church YouTube channel for these conversations, plus lots of video content. And if you're already listening to us on YouTube, subscribe to the Doable Discipleship Podcasts on Apple Podcasts or your favorite app, so you can listen in the car or wherever else you go. Don't forget to visit saddleback.com slash doable to check out all our previous episodes. And go to saddleback.com slash grow to find spiritual growth resources and view a calendar of upcoming events. Lastly, you can always get in touch with us by emailing maturity at saddleback.com. Send us your thoughts. Send us your questions, your Bible questions, your life questions, whatever. Who knows? Your question just might inspire an upcoming episode. Thanks again for tuning in to Doable Discipleship. I'm Doug Jones, and I hope you'll join us again next week. 